Lord said to Moses, Give Aaron the following instructions. When you set up the seven lamps in the lampstand, place them so their light shines forward in front of the lampstand. So Aaron did this. He set up the seven lamps so they reflected their light forward, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. The entire lampstand, from its base to its decorative blossoms, was made of beaten gold. It was built according to the exact design the Lord had shown Moses. The Levites dedicated. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now set the Levites apart from the rest of the people of Israel and make them ceremonially clean. Do this by sprinkling them with the water of purification and have them shave their entire body and wash their clothing. Then they will be ceremonially clean. Have them bring a young bull and a grain offering of choice flour moistened with olive oil, along with a second young bull for a sin offering. Then assemble the whole community of Israel and present the Levites at the entrance of the tabernacle. When you present the Levites before the Lord, the people of Israel must lay their hands on them. Raising his hands, Aaron must then present the Levites to the Lord as a special offering from the people of Israel, thus dedicating them to the Lord's service. Next, the Levites will lay their hands on the heads of the young bulls, present one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering to the Lord, to purify the Levites and make them right with the Lord. Then have the Levites stand in front of Aaron and his sons, and raise your hands and present them as a special offering to the Lord. In this way, you will set the Levites apart from the rest of the people of Israel, and the Levites will belong to me. After this, they may go into the tabernacle to do their work, because you have purified them and presented them as a special offering. Of all the people of Israel, the Levites are reserved for me. I have claimed them for myself in place of all the firstborn sons of the Israelites. I have taken the Levites as their substitutes. For all the firstborn males among the people of Israel are mine, both of people and of animals. I set them apart for myself on the day I struck down all the firstborn sons of the Egyptians. Yes, I have claimed the Levites in place of all the firstborn sons of Israel. And of all the Israelites, I have assigned the Levites to Aaron and his sons. They will serve in the tabernacle on behalf of the Israelites and make sacrifices to purify the people so no plague will strike them when they approach the sanctuary. So Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel dedicated the Levites, carefully following all the Lord's instructions to Moses. The Levites purified themselves from sin and washed their clothes, and Aaron lifted them up and presented them to the Lord as a special offering. He then offered a sacrifice to purify them and make them right with the Lord. After that, the Levites went into the tabernacle to perform their duties, assisting Aaron and his sons. So they carried out all the commands that the Lord gave Moses concerning the Levites. The Lord also instructed Moses, This is the rule the Levites must follow. They must begin serving in the tabernacle at the age of 25, and they must retire at the age of 50. After retirement, they may assist their fellow Levites by serving as guards at the tabernacle, but they may not officiate in the service. This is how you must assign duties to the Levites. Uh, in verses 8, well, from chapter 8, 1 to 4, the lamps provided light for the priests as they carried out their duties. The light was also an expression of God's presence. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. John 8, verse 12. The golden lampstand is still one of the major symbols of the Jewish faith. In chapter 8, verses 25 to 26. Why were the Levites supposed to retire at age 50? The reason was probably more practical than theological. 1. Moving the tabernacle and its fur furniture throughout the wilderness requires strength. The younger men were, most, were more suited for the work of lifting heavy articles. 2. The Levites uh, over 50 did not stop working altogether. They were allowed to assist with various light duties in the tabernacle. This helped the younger men assume more responsibilities and allowed the older men in a position to advise and counsel them. We'll continue on to chapter 9. Chapter 9, the second Passover. A year after Israel's departure from Egypt, the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai. In the first month of that year, he said, Tell the Israelites to celebrate the Passover at the prescribed time. 
at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. Be sure to follow all my decrees and regulations concerning this celebration. So Moses told the people to celebrate the Passover in the wilderness of Sinai as twilight fell on the 14th day of the month. And they celebrated the festival there, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. But some of the men had been ceremonially defiled by touching a dead body, so they could not celebrate the Passover that day. They came to Moses and Aaron that day and said, We have become ceremonially unclean by touching a dead body, but why should we be prevented from presenting the Lord's offering at the proper time with the rest of the Israelites? Moses answered, Wait here until I have received instructions for you from the Lord. This was the Lord's reply to Moses. Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. If any of the people now or in future generations are ceremonially unclean at Passover time because of touching a dead body, or if they are on a journey and cannot be present at the ceremony, they may still celebrate the Lord's Passover. They must offer the Passover sacrifice one month later at twilight on the 14th day of the second month. They must eat the Passover lamb at that time with bitter salad greens and bread made without yeast. They must not leave any of the lamb until the next morning, and they must not break any of its bones. They must follow all the normal regulations concerning the Passover. But those who neglect to celebrate the Passover at the regular time, even though they are ceremonially clean and not away on a trip, will be cut off from the community of Israel. If they fail to present the Lord's offering at the proper time, they will suffer the consequences of their guilt. And if foreigners living among you want to celebrate the Passover to the Lord, they must follow these same decrees and regulations. The same laws apply both to native-born Israelites and to the foreigners living among you. The Fiery Cloud On the day the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered it. But from evening until morning, the cloud over the tabernacle looked like a pillar of fire. This was the regular pattern. At night, the cloud that covered the tabernacle had the appearance of fire. Whenever the cloud lifted from over the sacred tent, the people of Israel would break camp and follow it. And wherever the cloud settled, the people of Israel would set up camp. In this way, they traveled and camped at the Lord's command wherever he told them to go. Then they remained in their camp as long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle. If the cloud remained over the tabernacle for a long time, the Israelites stayed and performed their duty to the Lord. Sometimes the cloud would stay over the tabernacle for only a few days, so the people would stay for only a few days, as the Lord commanded. Then, at the Lord's command, they would break camp and move on. Sometimes the cloud stayed only overnight and lifted the next morning. But day or night, when the cloud lifted, the people broke camp and moved on. Whether the cloud stayed above the tabernacle for two days, a month, or a year, the people of Israel stayed in camp and did not move on. But as soon as it lifted, they broke camp and moved on. So they camped or traveled at the Lord's command, and they did whatever the Lord told them through Moses. I, one of the things that God was speaking to me about today, because it talked about bread, right? Bread's part of the offering. Um, is that bread is, well, first of all, it's a heavenly food. It's a heavenly thing. And it was inherent from the beginning of mankind. Because you think of, like, Cain and Abel, what was the very first offering? Well, it was a grain offering. So the Lord had already taught uh, man to eat bread. And when God says man should not live on bread alone, it doesn't mean that uh, bread's bad for you. Bread's actually really good. So I think I, I was thinking about diet, right, and what God calls us to. And sometimes you don't want to eat too much bread, right? But uh, it's, it's good to have some bread in your life, especially since Jesus is the bread of life. The other thing that was really interesting is this pillar, uh, pillar of cloud above the tabernacle. That every time it lifted at the will of the Lord, they had to move all of a sudden. Yeah. Yeah. And I just think, you know, to start, stop, start, stop. And they did that for 40 years, right? Yeah. And, and right now, I think that's a message to you, Gideon, because if you are listening to the Lord about where you are supposed to be and how long the work is supposed to be. And, uh, I think the cloud symbolizes the Holy Spirit today. And so the Holy Spirit is like a cloud and he's threatening you. 
So you don't have to fret and worry if your cat is in a camp for expenses or if you're living in the house of Chris or if you're going to take with me or if you're going to Israel, you know, or if you're going to the, the marriage encounter weekend with Kaylin or whatever, because the Holy Spirit is leading you wherever the Holy Spirit says to go. That's where you can go for as long as you can. Mm -hmm. I guess, I guess in Joel's story, Joel didn't pursue after Lindsay. He didn't send her gifts, did he? He didn't write her messages. No. In fact, before she made them leave, they played the cold shoulder game for a very long time. It was so bad that he couldn't, when they would go to see each other briefly in the morning or whatever, so she'd make him move out of the bedroom. If he even touched her or anything, she it acted like fire, you know. It was so it was so horrible. He was being so um, already so lonely and so abused by her. That was terrible. Well, back and forth, right? I mean. Yeah, back and forth. Yeah. <sighs> and it was so mean. And to but to. What, she, what Lindsay really wanted was she wanted Joel to be her her and her and be close to her and it's too bad that whatever happened between them caused the opposite but she couldn't bridge that cold shoulder thing and then after that then she just when she told him to leave then her mother came to the house no she said she was leaving that's right and her mother came to the house and then Joel had just cried and said he was so sorry that he couldn't be the husband that Lindsay wanted. And he just cried. He said he wanted to be the husband she wanted. But see, Lindsay's own mother had done this to her father. And it was just terrible. Yeah, Kaylin really needs the support from Dolores. Really does. Yeah. She, uh, I, I figured something out. So, Roland has his own thing. He, it's search for happiness. Okay, so there's Roland's game. Um, then Hans's game is to bootstrap hard work like the good old days, but we don't live in the good old days. Things don't work like that anymore. It's different. It's a different world we live in. And work looks like many different things nowadays. And then, uh, for Dolores, uh, she never communicated with her husband. And so, um, you know, even, even the slightest bit of communication, you know, or effect would be very unusual for her. Kaylin grew up in a very quiet home. So any, any shouting, any arguments, anything, you know, would set them off, right? And so if you think that the communication was so bad that they didn't communicate at all and Roland left, right? And then you see me frustrated. What was I doing while well, I was blowing up? I was yelling. That's too much for me and my daughter. Too much. I'm done. Give up. You know, Kaylin, you should give up too. You can start to understand everybody's little piece, right? Mm -hmm. Of the equation. So that's, yeah. that's just a little something I was thinking about. But... I'll read in, in 9 here for the commentary. 9 verse 2. This is the second Passover. The first was instituted in Egypt and recorded in Exodus 12. Passover and the festival unleavened, of unleavened bread uh, were an eight-day religious observance. Uh, Leviticus 23, 5 to 6. Commemorate, uh, commemorating the Israelites' escape from slavery in Egypt by God's power. Uh, 9 verses 6 to 12, several men came to Moses because of the predicament they faced. They were ceremonially defiled because of their contact with the dead body or entering the home of a person who had died. And this prevented them from participating in the Passover meal. Notice that God did, did not adjust the requirements of the Passover. The standards of holiness were maintained and the men were not allowed to participate. But God did make an exception and allowed the men to celebrate Passover at a later date. Uh, this upheld the sacred requirements while allowing the men to participate in the feast. 
a duty for all Israelite men. Sometimes we face predicaments where the most obvious solution might cause us to compromise God's standards, like Moses. We should use wisdom and prayer to reach a workable solution. 9 verse 14, God said regarding foreigners and the Passover, they must allow the same decrees and regulations. The principle designed for foreigners doesn't mean we uh, mandate our religion to our neighbors, but in our homes we should live uh, with convictions. When we have guests in our homes, whether visitors or family, we might be tempted to change or water down our Christian practices. If family devotion, attending church, and mealtime prayers are your practices, don't change these when you have guests. Holidays such as Christmas and Easter should not reduce to nothing more than society's expressions. Furthermore, you should maintain your family standards even when guests visits. For example, unmarried couples who are our guests should not uh, be allowed to sleep together. Maintain your Christian standards and principles. You never know uh, what influence you may have on your guests in your home. Chapter 9, 15 to 22. A pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of uh, uh, a fire by night guided and protected the Israelites as they traveled across the wilderness. Some have said this pillar may have been burning bull a pitch whose smoke was visible during the day and whose fire could be seen during the night. However, a bowl of pitch would not have lifted itself up and moved ahead of the people. And the Bible is clear that the cloud of fire moved in accordance with the will of God. The cloud and the fire were not merely natural phenomenon. They were a vehicle of God's presence and the visible evidence of his moving and directing his people. For anybody who questions, you know, whether God is real, um, I was just saying this to Kelly. There's something like 600,000 men with all the tribes that are following Moses you know, aim, like I would say aimlessly from their perspective or aimed after God's movements for 40 years in the desert. So it just proves for anyone to get 600,000 people to follow you that there must be a God. There must have been something special going on. Otherwise, why would you follow with 600,000 people? Why would you follow this man? 9 verse 23, the Israelites traveled and camped uh, as God guided. When you follow God's guidance, you know um, you are where God wants you. Whether you're moving or staying in one place, you are physically somewhere right now. Instead of praying, God, what do you want me to do next? Ask God, what do you want me to do while I'm here? Oh, I need to start doing that. God, what do you want me to do while I'm here? Direction from God is not just your next big move. He has purpose in placing you right where you are right now. Begin to understand God's purpose in your life by discovering where he wants you, what he wants you to do now. The next... The next, uh, the two silver trumpets were used to coordinate the tribes and they moved through the wilderness. To keep so many people uh, in tight formations required clear communication and control. Trumpet blasts also reminded Israel of God's protection over them. That's really beautiful. Chapter 10, the silver trumpets. Yeah, now the Lord said to Moses, Make two trumpets of hammered silver for calling the community to assemble and for signaling the breaking of camp. When both trumpets are blown, everyone must gather before you at the entrance of the tabernacle. But if only one trumpet is blown, then only the leaders, the heads of the clans of Israel, must present themselves to you. When you sound the signal to move on, the tribes camped on the east side of the tabernacle must break camp and move forward. When you sound the signal a second time, the tribes camped on the south will follow. You must sound short blasts as the signal for moving on. But when you call the people to an assembly, blow the trumpets with a different signal. Only the priests, Aaron's descendants, are allowed to blow the trumpets. This is a permanent law for you to be observed from generation to generation. 
When you arrive in your own land and go to war against your enemies who attack you, sound the alarm with the trumpets. Then the Lord your God will remember you and rescue you from your enemies. Blow the trumpets in times of gladness, too, sounding them at your annual festivals and at the beginning of each month. And blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and peace offerings. The trumpets will remind the Lord your God of his covenant with you. I am the Lord your God. The Israelites leave Sinai. In the second year after Israel's departure from Egypt, on the twentieth day of the second month, the cloud lifted from the tabernacle of the covenant. So the Israelites set out from the wilderness of Sinai and traveled on from place to place until the cloud stopped in the wilderness of Paran. When the people set out for the first time, following the instructions the Lord had given through Moses, Judah's troops led the way. They marched behind their banner, and their leader was Nashon, son of Amminadab. They were joined by the troops of the tribe of Issachar, led by Nathanael, son of Zor, and the troops of the tribe of Zebulun, led by Eliab, son of Helon. Then the tabernacle was taken down, and the Gershonite and Merarite divisions of the Levites were next in the line of march, carrying the tabernacle with them. Reuben's troops went next, marching behind their banner. Their leader was Eliezer, son of Shader. They were joined by the troops of the tribe of Simeon, led by Shelomiel, son of Zerushaddai, and the troops of the tribe of Gad, led by Eliasaph, son of Duel. Next came the Kohathite division of the Levites carrying the sacred objects from the tabernacle. Before they arrived at the next camp, the tabernacle would already be set up at its new location. Ephraim's troops went next, marching behind their banner. Their leader was Elishama, son of Amihud. They were joined by the troops of the tribe of Manasseh, led by Gamaliel, son of Pedazer, and the troops of the tribe of Benjamin, led by Abidin, son of Gideoni. Dan's troops went last, marching behind their banner and serving as the rear guard for all the tribal camps. Their leader was Ahizer, son of Amishadai. They were joined by the troops of the tribe of Asher, led by Pajil, son of Akron, and the troops of the tribe of Naphtali, led by Ahira, son of Enon. This was the order in which the Israelites marched, division by division. One day Moses said to his brother-in-law, Hobab, son of Ruel, the Midianite, We are on our way to the place the Lord promised us, for he said, I will give it to you. Come with us, and we will treat you well, for the Lord has promised wonderful blessings for Israel. But Hobab replied, No, I will not go. I must return to my own land and family. Please don't leave us, Moses pleaded. You know the places in the wilderness where we should camp. Come, be our guide. If you do, we'll share with you all the blessings the Lord gives us. They marched for three days after leaving the mountain of the Lord, with the ark of the Lord's covenant moving ahead of them to show them where to stop and rest. As they moved on each day, the cloud of the Lord hovered over them. And whenever the ark set out, Moses would shout, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. Let them flee before you. And when the ark was set down, he would say, Return, O Lord, to the countless thousands of Israel. Two months ago? Yeah, the Feast of Trumpets. Hmm. One of the fall festival, beginning of the fall festival season, first is the Feast of Trumpets, and then there's the Day of Atonement, and then there's the Feast of Booth, and then there's the Feast of Tabernacles. Hmm. So it's a big thing. And it starts with trumpets. The two yeah, silver... Oh, sorry. The two silver trumpets were used to coordinate the tribes as they moved through the wilderness to keep many people in, form in tight formations required clear communication and control. The trumpet blasts also remind them of Israel's God protection over them. Those, uh, those who travel move on face new challenges, uh, move or face new challenges, know what it is like to be uprooted. Life is full of cha uh, changes, and few things remain stable. The Israelites were constantly moving through the wilderness. They were able to handle change only because God's presence in the tabernacle was always with them. 
The portable tabernacle signified God and his people moving together. For us, stability does not mean lack of change, but moving with God in every circumstance. Israel's departure from Sinai. It has been two years since Israel left Egypt, having received God's travel instructions through Moses, Israel set out from Mount Sinai into the wilderness of Paran on their way to the Promised Land. By complementing Horeb's, uh, uh, Hobab's wilderness skills, Moses let him know he was needed. People cannot know your appreci- uh, you appreciate them if you do not tell them that they're important to you. Mom, you're important to me. Complementing those who does who deserve in building lasting relationship and helps people know that they are valued. You are valued, Mom. Oh, think about think about those who have ha- helped you this month. Um, Chris, you, every single day that you pray, every single day you answer these calls. Um, God, of course, his provision. Um... Kelly and Josiah with with what time they value. Gabriella for being so sweet and giving me hugs and just loving me. <laughs> She's just a child with no question. I just love you. <laughs> uh, what can you do to let them know how much you need and appreciate them? Uh, well, I don't want to let anyone know that I need them as much. You know, I've been very needy for such a long time so um you know i i I biked today to the (laughs) that sounds so backwards to the food bank for two things one to meet meet the people who are using the food bank and be able to minister and pray with them and talk to them which i did which was great two to to grab something to give back to you know chris and everybody else who just keeps giving to me right um felt like i wanted to give back and it seems weird because i'm taking something that's provided right and and number three is that there's too much provision there's so much that gets dumped and so i shouldn't feel so bad um so what did you pick up today oh just a few things it never seems like much as soon as i put it away it doesn't seem like much but uh it helps, I right? I specifically prayed that you would get to go to the food bank today, but I was hoping that that lady would give you a ride or someone would give you a ride. Yeah, I asked Kelly for a ride. That that sort of didn't happen, but that's okay. I biked down there, and then I biked up with my backpack full of that stuff. Yeah, it was a good workout. Well, you could probably go to that food bank more that they're so much giving to you. How much you appreciate the opportunity to get the food, and maybe you could even volunteer on Sunday and then go go to the food with them or something. Good thoughts. Move into a time and meditate on the following psalm. Psalm 42. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Oh, this is one of my favorite ones. As a deer pants for uh, flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food, day and night, while they say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How would I go? uh, How I would go with the throng and lead them in the procession of the house of God. With glad shouts and songs of praise and a multitude of a multitude keeping festival. It's just it's so interesting because there's so much boasting I'm giving towards God. God's going to do this. He says he's going to do this. It hasn't happened yet. (laughs) And people are like, Gideon, whoa, whoa, whoa. you're you're boasting too much of, of God and no one can say anything about it. Mm-hmm. I don't boast in myself. I only boast in you, Lord. Yeah, that's that's Paul's scripture. Paul that said that. Mm-hmm. And the other thing too that um, <clears throat> that I'm proclaiming the things that God is doing, and He gets to defend Himself, and that's here in the in the Psalm too. 
Why are you cast Ooh. down? Oh, oh, sorry. No, I like that one too. Why are you cast down, oh my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall praise. Uh, I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep. At the roar of your waterfalls, all your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day the Lord commands a steadfast love, and at night his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, Why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning? Because of the oppression of, of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me. While they say to me all day long, Where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. God, I hope in you, and I shall again praise you, my salvation and my God. Help to remind my soul that, Father, to look up and to remember the good that you have done. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for Numbers 8 to 10. It's not easy reading Numbers. It's not an easy thing to get through. It's, it's tough for most people, including myself, because it's very descriptory. But I see 600,000 plus men following Moses, following you, God, by your leading. And it's, it's a miracle. And they get up and move whenever you tell them to move. And they stay put when you tell them to stay put. And they do exactly what you tell them to do. And they did that till the, till the day that they died. <laughs> Many of them. God, we are called to serve you to the day that we die, even if it's just moving from place to place. Under the obedience of your command. We love you, God. Help us to be obedient to you, to listen to you, and to seek after you. God, your grace is so big for it only to be two years or less for this, for this season. God, you are so big to even desire to overcome the situation between my wife and I. God, you are so big to desire to stop divorce and uh, to bring about reconciliation on this island, on these islands, God. God, you are so big and yet you care about every detail. God, we love you, we worship you, we know that you're doing something bigger. Thank you for the hope that's in my mom. It's not gone to waste, it's not aimless. The Holy Spirit was proven in the ministry that's being built across from her. The Holy Spirit was proven in prophesying for the ministry that took place um, with Pregnancy Crisis Center. These are acts of God. And God, you want to do a big act between Kaylin and I, and I speak that forward, Father. I speak forward that she will be there at the Hope Restored Ministry, God. That she will be there for that meeting. And that, God, what you have there is very valuable, and lives will be changed there. Marriages will be changed there. Marriages will be reconciled there, God. Many marriages will come to their reconciliation. As they turn their eyes up to you, and they realize how small their problems really are, that they can love one another in spite of their sin, in spite of their differences. That they can put you as their desire. And that they will honor their covenantal vows before God himself. After you, God. Thank you, Jesus, that you again love us. Thank you, Jesus, that we are not alone. We declare your good and mighty power in the name of Jesus Christ and your glory to be shone. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Yes, Lord. Thank you for the reading of the three chapters in Numbers, starting with the two silver trumpets. Now, there's something about hearing a clarion call, hearing the sound of the shofar, which is a ram's horn, used for a lot, not an alarm, and for a declaration, mm -hmm. a celebration, for in gathering. Mm -hmm. And the silver trumpets used to direct the people, to order the people. And it was a sense of security in having this role. It makes all those 600,000 Israelites feel like they're part of a family 
the part of our people who is with the living nation. Mm-hmm. And you said to us that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people belonging to God. And so that's what we are. And we just don't so desperately we want you, Lord God, to lead us so that we know we're following you. We're listening for your voice. And we're following after the cloud. When the cloud moves, we move. When the cloud stays, we stay. That's where our security is. That's where our safety net lies. You are our shepherd. That's where our sheepfold is. And we are listening for your voice because we are your sheep and we will not listen to the voice of a stranger. So we keep declaring the truth over this marriage and over Kaylin and Gideon. We keep believing and hoping because you gave us a word and you said that hope never fails. So I just, I love you, Lord, and I thank you that you're sustaining Gideon and helping him to overcome every moment of suffering and pain. Every moment he looks up and he sees something to be happy about and thankful for. And even today there were many such blessings. I pray that tonight when he goes to sleep that he'll have a really good rest and that Kaylin too and he will meet in the in the spirit realm in terms of their dreams that you could connect them and make them feel close together even though they are so far apart and yet in their hearts Gideon is very close to her and in her heart I pray she will come close to him. Connect us physically to God we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Yes, we bring, look forward bring this to the marriage boundary the down in the name of Jesus Christ. Break these walls down, Yeshua, mm -hmm. in the name of Jesus Christ. Yes. Work a miracle, Father. We just declare that you work a miracle, God. Yes. That you be glorified in this, God. Just Thank declare you. that in the name of Jesus Christ. God, I've come out to the open. I'm not. I'm not hiding anymore. Am I? But Kaylin's still in her shelter. She's still hiding from the wolves. Mm. Call her out, Jesus. She has no uh, need to fear the wolves or fear me. Or fear God himself. Mm In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.